And right now, we are in the middle of a larger section. And this larger section is some really bad news. The larger section is all about God's condemnation of all people. Uh, I remember, <laughs> I remember uh, back in high school, I was taking a, a pre-calc class, and um, there's this one teacher that I had, and she was doing some review for in preparation for our final exam, and she asked us some questions that we were not doing well, and she kind of gave us this look, and she was from the south, and she just said, "Y'all gonna fail," uh, <laughs> and. <laughs> In some sense, this is this section is y'all y'all are condemned, and it's it's not an easy section. It's not one of those sections that is uplifting. It is one of these sections in Scripture that make us sorrowful, but hopefully, that the sorrow leads to repentance. So this is a section about God's condemnation of all people, whether you are Jewish, whether you are not Jewish or Gentile. And so in this section, it's all about condemnation. And beginning in Romans chapter 1, verse 18, we find that all of humanity has condemned everybody. It doesn't matter where you are. And it begins really with an indictment of the Gentiles. God is the creator, and he has created the world in such a fashion, in such a way that all who have been created have at least some evidence of his existence. But instead of searching for our creator, we have suppressed knowledge of his existence and devised complicated theories that even we don't fully understand. And as a result of these things, all Gentiles stand condemned before the holy and just God of the universe. Then beginning in Romans 2 verse 1, this book switches to address the Jews. As if, uh, as if, you know, sometimes, uh, you know, if you were a kid and, and your parents were kind of um, dressing you down with you and your sibling and you're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But then your parents eventually turn to you and go, hey, you're not, you're not innocent either. And so in this way, it's like, yes, the, the argument of the book has really condemned Gentiles, but it says Jews, Jews don't get a free pass here. Uh, if anything, the Jews have a higher accountability for what they have been given. And so this book, starting in Romans 2, 1, switches to address the Jews. And these are God's chosen people. They were given tremendous benefits and blessings. And God provided, maybe God provided general knowledge of his existence to all people everywhere and to Gentiles included. But to the Jews, he revealed himself in a very personal and specific way. The Jews knew better because God had told them more. And when it came to knowing the one true God of the universe, Israel had every conceivable advantage. Our passage this morning reviews Israel's privileges and then reminds them that they are accountable for these privileges. We are reminded uh, of what Jesus said in Luke, that to whom much is given, much is required. Please turn in your Bibles, therefore, to our passage for this morning, found in Romans chapter 2, verses 17 to 24. Romans chapter 2, verses 17 to 24. And when you get there, I'd invite you to please stand for the public reading of Scripture. Romans 2, 17 to 24. Verse 17, but if you call yourself a Jew and rely on the law and boast in God and know his will and approve what is excellent because you are instructed from the law, and if you are sure that you yourself are a guide to the blind, a light to those who are in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of children, having in the law the embodiment of knowledge and truth, You then who teach others, do you not teach yourself? While you preach against stealing, do you steal? You who say that one must not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? You who boast in the law, dishonor God by breaking the law. For as it is written, the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. 
May God bless the reading of his holy word. You may be seated. Now, even from this brief cursory reading, as we looked at it together, you know that this passage is biting. It's almost as if Paul is loading ammunition and then turning sight to set sights upon the Jewish people. This passage is laden with statements that culminate in to accusations that result in conviction. Like a lawyer making his case before a jury, Paul skillfully presents an argument that leads to one inescapable conclusion that there will be accountability from the Lord. And it's funny here when we think about things like accountability, the word itself has a way of making everybody more serious. Approaching due dates and looming deadlines have a way of making us pay more attention. And I think all of us remember when we were students, there are times when we were mentally checked out, when we were present in body, but absent in mind, we're just zoning out, but there were only six words that needed to be said that all of a sudden makes everybody pay attention. This will be on your test. It's funny how when you hear that, everybody, oh, what, 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 what did the teacher just say? And then you, you, you see the guys who are totally like falling asleep going, wait, wait what, what was that? What, what? Okay, can I see your notes? Can I get your notes? I'll pay you later. You know, just this is, this is what happens. Because when accountability is there, people are sobered up. All of a sudden, there's a, there's a degree of seriousness that wasn't there before. And so when somebody says, this is going to be on your test, everybody pays attention. This is the power potential of accountability. It brings a degree of seriousness to the situation. And our passage this morning unfolds in two sections. In verses 17 to 20, we have a portrait of Israel's privileged access to God. It's privileged access to God. Now, the Jewish relationship to God was intended to give shape to their relationship to other people. So let's begin first by looking at what this passage says about the Jewish relationship to God. Verses 17 to 18. It says, But if you call yourself a Jew and rely on the law and boast in God and know his will and approve what is excellent because you are instructed from the law. So let's examine these five descriptive phrases about the Jewish relationship to God. First, There's a name. First, there's a name. You call yourself a Jew. For centuries, God's people were identifiable by various names. They were called the children of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They were called the Israelites, named after their forefather, Jacob, who was named, who had his name changed from Jacob to Israel. They were also called the Hebrews, which some language experts link to the word apiru, which refers to wandering nomads. The name Jew here comes from the name for the region Judea, which refers to the area west of the Dead Sea. And this is where you would find the cities of Jerusalem, Bethlehem, Jericho, and the Qumran community. So to call yourself a Jew was to embrace the heritage of God's people, was to embrace a geographical location. This is what it meant to be a Jew and to call yourself a Jew. Secondly, in verse 17, we see that they have their source of security in God. They rely on the law. And the word for rely here means to find your well-being or your inner security. To rely on the law is to find your comfort and rest in it. The Hebrew equivalent of this Greek term is often translated to lean on something, right? Like when Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 tells us to trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. So when we teach our children, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so, we are in fact, in effect, telling them to derive and ground their comfort from the word of God. Third, the Jewish relationship with God is described as having confidence and they boast in God. To be an Israelite in this time was to know the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And there is a sense in which all who trust in God 
should be able to boast in God. They trusted in God and they could boast in knowing God. Just as Jeremiah 9 says, Thus says the Lord, let not the wise man boast in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man boast in his might. Let not the rich man boast in his riches. But let him who boasts boast in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord who practices steadfast love, justice, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, declares the Lord. Now these next two descriptions, knowledge and judgment, are related because they are derived from being instructed from the law. So it says in verse 18, though in that you know his will and approve what is excellent because you are instructed from the law. The Jews knew God's will because they had God's law. It wasn't a guessing game for them. It was written. And when they had doubts, they could check it out. Uh, in the sermon from last week, I explained that all people are exposed to some sort of law. For the Gentiles, they have a law that is written on their hearts. A general way to distinguish between right and wrong. A conscience. But the Jews had an additional law given to them through Moses, which allowed them to discern between good and evil with greater precision than those who simply had the law written on their hearts. And this law given to the Jews was meant that they would grow in knowledge and that they would learn what is good versus what is bad and learn the difference between what is good and what is better. In Philippians 1, 9 to 11, Paul writes a similar phrase, says, and it is my prayer. He's writing to the church in Philippi and he's, he's telling them, this is my prayer for you. And, this, and it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment so that you may approve what is excellent. And so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. So in describing the Jews, Paul begins with their identity, who they are. And a major aspect of their identity is their relationship with God. They claimed to have a special relationship with God, and they did because God had made a special relationship with them. God had revealed himself in ways to the Jews that he had not revealed to non-Jews. Their name refers to the land that God had promised to them. They, their security, their comfort, their, 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 their security comes from relying on the law. They boast confidently about knowing who God is and their knowledge of God's law gives them, gives them knowledge and the ability to judge between good and evil. Having received so many good things from above, God sent them out into the world to be his representatives. And the Jewish relationship with God also comes with the commission to be witnesses to people who do not know God. So their privileged access to God first and foremost comes from their relationship to God. But it also has an impact, has bearing upon the Jewish relationship to other people. Verses 19 to 20. It says, and if you are sure that you yourself are a guide to the blind, a light to those who are in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of children, having in the law the embodiment of knowledge and truth. As you read these verses, maybe you raised an eyebrow and kind of shook your head. Like, really? The Old Testament, I mean, last, last time I looked in the Old Testament, it it, it seems to be a historical record of Jewish failure to obey God, a, a failure to be a light to the world. But here's where we also need to remember that there is a difference between what God commands and what happens through human actions because God may command humans to do it, but humans don't necessarily obey. God gave his perfect law to his imperfect people. God gave them the law so that they would follow it, not so that they would disregard it. God promised by covenant to bless his people as a result of their obedience. God promised them fruitfulness, peace, and prosperity. He promised that Israel would become a leading nation, a prominent nation, because of their obedience to God. But instead of obeying, instead of following God, 
Israel wandered away from God. Instead of obeying God's commands, Israel disobeyed his commands. And instead of submitting to God's rule and authority, Israel rejected it. All of this is to say that when we read that the nation of Israel is a guide to the blind, a light to those who are in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of children, having in the law the embodiment of knowledge and truth, we are reading about God's intended design and plan for his people. This is what they are supposed to do. This is who they are supposed to be. God designed for his people to flourish and then to be a witness to the surrounding nations. God's plan was for Israel to be a testimony of the goodness of God to the world around them. And when we examine scripture, we find evidence of this plan of God's intentions embedded into various passages in the Old Testament. In Deuteronomy 4, verses 5 to 6, it says, See, I have taught you statutes and rules as the Lord my God commanded me that you should do them in the land that you are entering to take possession of it. Keep them and do them, for that will be your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the peoples who, when they hear all these statutes, will say, surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. You have this idea of obedience leading to blessing, leading to witness. Psalm 67, which uh, we, we read earlier today, may, may God be gracious to us and bless us, make his face to shine upon us. Selah. That your way may be known on earth, your saving power among all nations, not just this chosen nation, all nations. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. Look at what God says in Isaiah 49, verse 6. It is too light a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to bring back the preserved of Israel. I will make you as a light for the nations that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. And I say all this to remind us that these phrases were supposed to describe Israel and her relationship to people who do not know God. They're supposed to be a guide to the blind. They're supposed to be light to those in darkness. They're supposed to be an instructor to the foolish and a teacher of the immature. Since it had God's law, the embodiment of knowledge and truth, Israel was positioned and purposed to lead others to God. Their vertical relationship to God was supposed to have a horizontal impact. Now, if you've been listening carefully, you may have noticed that I skipped over some very important words in verses 17 and 19. It says, if. Look at the passage with me. But if you call yourself a Jew and rely on the law and boast in God and know his will and approve what is excellent because you are instructed from the law and if. You are sure that you yourself are a guide to the blind, a light to those who are in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of children, having in the law the embodiment of knowledge and truth. These two if clauses set up conditional statements. If A is true, then B is true. If A, then B. And so we need to look closer at the first two, at the two facets of the conditional statement. Is the conditional, is, is the condition true? Are they really? In the, in the first point of the passage, of this message, I've labored to show you that, yes, the if statement is true. They are supposed to be a guide to the blind. They are supposed to be light to those who are in darkness. They are. They have been positioned that way. So, yes, the if statement is true. Now, if A, then B. So, what's part B? What's the conclusion? What is the B statement? And the B statement is that there's accountability. If all these things, then they are accountable for it. And this is personal accountability before God. If A, then B. If you have all this privileged access to God, that God himself has given to you, he has disclosed himself in a personal and special way to you, then, if that is true, and that is true, then there is personal accountability before God. 
If the Jews have all this privileged access to God, and they do, then God will hold them accountable. And in verses 21 to 22, we read some scathing questions that are thrown at the Jews, accusing them of hypocrisy. Look with me at verses 21 to 23. You then who teach others, do you not teach yourself? While you preach against stealing, do you steal? You who say that one must not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? You who boast in the law, dishonor God by breaking the law. Nestled within these three verses, we find five examples of hypocrisy. First, we see unteachable teachers. You then who teach others, do you not teach yourself? Unteachable teachers. Those who are supposed to encourage learning, refusing to learn. Unteachable teachers. Second, we see thieves against stealing. While you preach against stealing, do you steal? We see adulterers against adultery. You who say that one must not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? And then we also see idol keepers against idols. You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? And lastly, lawbreakers who boast in the law. You who boast in the law dishonor God by breaking the law. Now, of these five examples, right, we see that all of these are blatant, are, are meant to be blatant examples of hypocrisy. Do as I say, not as I do. Now, one of them does appear a little bit strange. Verse 22 says, you who abhor idols, do you rob temples? Because that, that seems, well, I... Abhor idols, do you love idols? Wouldn't that just be the, the reverse, the, the opposite? And commentators disagree on the exact meaning of this accusation. Okay? But given the general context of verses 21, 22, and 23, the idea is you're doing the very things you teach against. So obviously there's an inconsistency. You say one thing, you do the opposite. We can understand that Paul here is accusing the Jews of hypocrisy. Deuteronomy 7.23 says, with regard to idols, it says, And you shall not bring an abominable, an abominable thing into your house and become devoted to destruction like it. You shall utterly detest and abhor it, for it is devoted to destruction. So what that verse says is that how Jews are supposed to treat idols is they are supposed to utterly destroy them, eliminate them not take them into their houses. Now, God wanted his people to destroy idols. And apparently, some Jews may have been engaged in idol recycling. They would take the metal idols, melt them down, and then reuse that metal. And in a way, then they were, it was like they were robbing temples. Now let's pause and consider these accusations broadly. To be sure, not every Jew was engaged in this kind of behavior. And yet we see these accusations. And I believe that Paul here is using some of the most egregious and outlandish examples of hypocrisy that were being practiced during this time. Not necessarily by every Jew who was around, but he's pointing out these are blatant obvious examples of inconsistency, of hypocrisy, of telling people to do one thing and yet you yourself doing something else. And it ultimately points back to what, what witness is being shown. God gave the Jews the law so that they could live according to it. Not so that they could live against it. God gave the Israelites his law so that they could be a light to the world. Not so that they could be the laughing stock of the world. God gave the Israelites his law so that they could be an example of how to honor God. Not so that they could be an example of how to dishonor God. To whom much is given, much is required. 
And we remember that when Jesus came to earth, he took issue with the religious leaders in particular. You know, Jesus, I think in our common culture, we think of Jesus as like buddy Jesus. It's like the guy with the perpetual smile and the thumbs up kind of thing. But Jesus had harsh words for certain groups of people. Yes, he was very loving and certainly caring and full of grace and compassion. But he called people out when they needed to be called out. And one of the groups that Jesus called out quite sternly were the religious leaders, the scribes and the Pharisees. And what, who are those people? Those are people who should know better. Those are people who do know better by their years of study and intense examination of Scripture. They should know better because they do know better, but they know just because you know better doesn't mean that you do better. These religious leaders received Jesus' harshest rebukes. In Matthew 23, we have these seven woes that are pronounced upon the religious leaders. And some, some of the things that he said is this. He said that they do not practice what they preach. It sounds familiar. He called them hypocrites. He called them blind guides. Blind guides. Well, that sounds a lot like this passage, doesn't it? He called them full of lawlessness. Again, all of these things, that these woes that Jesus pronounced upon the religious leaders are echoed here in this passage and now being used to accuse and indict the Jews for their hypocrisy. And as a result of this ongoing hypocrisy, God has been dishonored. Verse 24. For, as it is written, the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. And this verse is most likely referring to Isaiah 52, verse 5, which says, Now therefore, what, ha what have I here, declares the Lord, seeing that my people are taken away for nothing? Their rulers wail declares the Lord. And continually all the day, my name is despised. Now in context, Isaiah chapter 52 is recounting Israel's defeat and the resulting captivity of this nation. And because Israel had disobeyed God's commands, God punished them. And part of that punishment was allowing them to be conquered and carried off away from the land that God had promised to them. Every moment, Israel spends in captivity is dishonoring to the Lord. It's out of whack. It's not as God has intended. God's people were supposed to be a light to the Gentiles. But living in captivity, hundreds of miles away from the promised land, promised to their forefathers, the inheritance that they were supposed to have from God, living far away from the land that God had given to them, they were not the light to the Gentiles. They were the laughing stock of the world. And even if you look at the Jewish history, even when they come back, it became a, well, I wonder who's in charge this decade. If you look at the history of the Jewish people, when they were brought back from captivity and put in their land, it may have been their land, but it wasn't under their control. Because they couldn't rule it themselves. They couldn't be autonomous. And so they were ruled by various groups. They were supposed to be a light to the Gentiles. But instead, they were the laughing stock of the world. Now, at some point during this sermon, you may have been wondering how this passage would apply to you. Last time I checked, I don't think we have a lot of Jewish people in our church. Could be wrong. But here is where we need to step back and consider the broader implications of Scripture. Because in this passage, Paul is making this general case that all people stand condemned before the holy and righteous God of the universe, who will judge people with truth and justice. And Gentiles may not have had access to the law of God given at Mount Sinai but they are still held accountable for the law that God has written on their hearts. And when they are closely examined, God will certainly condemn all Gentiles. will find them guilty. 
On the other hand, the Jews did have the advantage of knowing God's law. They were given God's law at Mount Sinai. And while God's law shaped their culture and influenced their nation, the Jews did not practice what they preached. Though they were intimately familiar with the teachings of God, the Israelites did not obey God's law perfectly. Therefore, the Israelites will also be condemned by God. So it's a reminder to us that whether Jew or Gentile, we are accountable for whatever God has given to us. Regardless of the level of access you have had, to the knowledge of God, you are accountable for it. And so we must consider what God has given. And for many of us, God has given us knowledge of him. You know, one of the wonderful things I get to do as a pastor is I get to listen to salvation testimonies. And God brings people to himself in so many ways. I think a couple of weeks ago, somebody, it was last week, somebody asked about how many of you heard, went to VBS growing up, and many of us here raised our hands. Sometimes it's, it's through some exposure at a young age to VBS, or maybe you grew up in the church. Other times, it's because of a life-threatening situation. You came face-to-face with your mortality, and you had to ask and really consider those questions about life after death. Some people have attended church for as long as they could remember. They don't ever remember doing anything different on a Sunday morning. Other people never went to church, only drove by it. I think we need to remember that God holds all of us accountable for what he has allowed us to learn. I found that some of the hardest people to talk to about Christ are people who grew up in the church. As the old saying goes, the sun that melts the wax also hardens the clay. Now, though our backgrounds may differ from the Jewish people, we did not grow up necessarily learning Hebrew or going through the bar mitzvah, bat mitzvah ceremonies. Many of us have grown up around the church. And whether it was because we wanted to go or because we were forced to go, we were exposed to teaching about God. And whether people would like to admit it or not, there are benefits to going to church. There are certainly common grace benefits. You regularly hear messages and you're exposed to talks, sermons about right and wrong. You are asked questions about what is your life really about. And because you are asked this on a regular basis, your lives are helped and benefited temporarily. As a result of growing up, going to church, you may be prevented from some more life-dominating, life-altering, life-controlling sins. Growing up, going to church may help you be, quote-unquote, more of a moral person, but your morality will never pass the test from God. Your morality will never be good enough to save you. So oftentimes I talk to parents, oh, you know, you vanished from church for a long time, and all of a sudden you come back because you got kids in tow. And sometimes these parents go, well, you know, we wanted to give them some sort of moral framework or guidance. I'm like, well, you know, that moral framework is good for now, but it ain't good forever. Each individual must respond to God's word 
and to the gospel through repentance and faith in Christ. And coming up, we coming here week after week, some people feel like, oh, I'm becoming more moral. And that's good, but it'll never be enough. It will never be enough with God. The only thing that can save us is faith in Christ. God has also given us responsibilities. And for those of us in Christ, God examines us and holds us accountable for how we have stewarded the responsibilities we have from him. And we should strive to be faithful with with whatever God has given to us. If God has given us children, let us raise them in the fear of the Lord to know God and to love God and to pursue Christ. If God has given us money, let us honor him in how we spend it. God has given us these responsibilities, these gifts over which we should be faithful stewards. And let us also consider other gifts that he has given to us, gifts of intellect or maybe spiritual gifts or natural abilities. Let us wield these gifts for God's honor and glory. You see, stewardship, properly understood, is is one of these concepts in Scripture that help us that help prevent us from idolizing the gifts and forgetting the giver. Because then we realize that we are called to be responsible and that there is accountability with God. So God has given you some gifts. You have to know that one day he's going to ask you what you did with it. There will be a summoning. There will be an examination. And we need to ask ourselves, are we honoring the Lord with what he has given to us? If it's knowledge of God, the first step is we need to repent and turn to Christ in faith. If it's these other things, we need to seek to be responsible and to be good stewards, to be faithful. We know we can't be perfect, but we need to be faithful. If it's these other gifts, like intellectual capacity or spiritual gifts or natural abilities, we need to ask, how can these gifts and abilities that God has given us, how can they serve God? It's not gifts God gives to us are not for hoarding. They're for blessing. We are blessed to be a blessing to others. We are accountable for what God has given us. And I know that, you know, as we're going through this book of Romans, there's a whole lot of, there's a whole lot of criticism and condemnation of Jewish people. And it's easy for us to kind of go, I'm not Jewish. And just kind of like dodge that. And yes, you're not Jewish, most of you. But we still grew up with some sort of background. And for many of us, we've grown up in or around the church. We need to remember that God holds us accountable. That it's not just a ho-hum, whatever. I'm here just because my parents are dragging me or whatever. You, You need to know that what you hear and what you've learned and what you've been exposed to, God holds you accountable for. Because if we look at this passage, we could easily rewrite this passage and kind of like contextualize it for a Christian who, for, for a, a kid who grows up in the church. If you call yourself, if you call yourself a Christian and you rely on knowing scripture and the memorization of it, and you boast in all of the knowledge that you know about God and about the Bible and about memory verses, and you know right and wrong because your pastor and your Sunday school teachers have been teaching you all this all this time, And you know better than other people. You know how to tell them what is right versus what is wrong. You know, you could rewrite that. You could actually modify that passage and contextualize it. Because that's a lot of people who grow up in the church. God has blessed us. If we have grown up in the church, God, that is a blessing from God. But that blessing comes with accountability. 
And we need to remember that. Second application for us this morning is seek to learn and practice for God's honor. The learning from scripture needs to lead to sanctified living. Scripture learning should lead to sanctified living. We need to treat Bible study as insights for living, not just information for accumulation. And I know that not every passage contains direct commands for us. We still need to think about what is a right response to the passage we read. How can I honor God with what this passage says? What does this teach me about God? What does this teach me about the human condition? What commands are there that I need to consider for myself? We don't just accumulate Bible knowledge so that one day, you know, if we ever got summoned to a Bible Jeopardy competition, we would win. We learn these truths to live according to them. We study scripture so that we may know the God of scripture and so that we may honor the God of scripture, not so we can just check it, check off another box on our read the Bible in a year bookmark. And that means correcting and addressing how we think about God and how we think about life. That may mean correcting how we feel about God, how we feel about life. And this ultimately would lead to correcting what we do in this life. Church, when we, when, we, when we look at passages like this that are challenging, that are indicting, that are biting, that have an edge to it, let us genuinely stop to consider our spiritual lives before God. And in that, we are thankful for God's word to the Jews because it reminds us of, that we are able to see from the outside, looking at the Jewish people and going, how blessed, how much God has given to them, how much he has told them about himself, so many privileges, so, many, so much access And then considering the hypocrisy that is highlighted here. And lest we think that somehow it's just about them, we have to consider what has God given to us? How much has he granted to you to know about him, to have access to his word, to sit under the preaching and teaching of God's word on a regular basis? Because there is accountability with God. There is always accountability. Let me pray for us. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you that even even from a passage that really focuses on the Jews and what they've been exposed to and, and how they've responded, that there is truth for us to consider. Help us to examine ourselves, and to consider whether we truly have placed our faith in you, in the sacrificial death and victorious resurrection of your son. Help us to take stock of all that you have given to us and ask and consider whether we have been faithful stewards. Because, Lord, we desire to honor and please you. We pray this in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen.